my steps in your word, dear Lord. Lead me, guide me every day. Send your anointing, Father, I pray. Order my steps in your word. Please order my steps in your word. Order, order, order my steps in your word, dear Lord. Lead me, guide me every day. Send your anointing, Father, I
time it is to be uh, in Christ, uh, what a blessing it is to be on this side of life with uh, sound mind, air in our lungs, and blood running warm through our veins. We are certainly excited and delighted that you are worshiping with us. We thank God for you. We thank God for your faithfulness and your patience, and we just ask that you continue to uh, stay steadfast, continue to trust in the Lord, and continue to know that God is more than able. Uh, as we have already mentioned, our uh, date for reopening will be the fifth uh, December the 5th, excuse me, which is the first Sunday in December. So we are uh, ready, we are, we're getting anxious. Uh, I know many of you have been waiting uh, patiently, and so uh, the first Sunday in December, which will be December the 5th, is when we will reopen. We will have all of the protocols in place. We will have, uh, and we're also calling any nurses of the Liberty City congregation who would like to help out uh, with contact tracing, not only on that Sunday, but day Sundays following that, so that we can make sure that we are um, exhibiting safety protocols and being safe and health conscious for everyone involved. So now, keep in mind all of those on our prayer list. Keep in mind Sister Pat Ball and her family, Sister Mildred Miles, um, Sister Bernice Toots who had surgery recently, Mark Cuthbert, uh, Urban Thomas, Katrina Hall. Continue, continue to pray for everyone for, uh, who are, who's on our sick list, uh, Sister Moore and her family, um, everyone, church that uh, we know we've been continually praying for, that you keep them on your prayer list, keep them lifted up in prayer. Those who may be traveling, that God will grant them traveling grace, uh, that they make it to where they're going safely and to be back home. Church, I'm excited to be here to worship with you. I pray that your hearts are ready to receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. Let's worship God together. We bring glory to God. We 
bring glory to God. To God. Glory to God forever. Yes. We bring glory to God. We bring glory. We bring. We bring glory. of your inheritance. 
the place, O Lord, which you have made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. I want to speak to you on this morning from this brief sermon, the power of thanksgiving. Power of thanksgiving. Uh, our song, uh, our, our song, if you will, this passage of scripture, this chapter actually, starts off by saying, Then Moses and the, uh, and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord. Then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord. Then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord. Then, which presupposes something has taken place before that. Then, it suggests to us something was going on in the lives of God's people, God's leader Moses, prior to them singing this song. As a matter of fact, the very fact that the chapter starts off with then they sang a song would suggest to us that Moses and all of Israel were induced to sing this song after something great had taken place in their life. So often, dear friends, we, we believe that Thanksgiving is just a once a year holiday, something that we celebrate when we get around family and friends and we sit around the table and mom and grandmother, have, they cook, uh, our sisters and all those who get involved, they cook these wonderful meals and we sit around the table and we laugh and we talk, we reminisce and we thank God for the food that we're about to eat. And honestly enough, we thank God for our families being able to come to uh, a one place and to assemble and fellowship and to love on one another. But might I suggest to you, dear friends, that the child of God, for the child of God, thanksgiving is a everyday affair. For the child of God, thanksgiving doesn't come around once a year. For the child of God, thanksgiving does not happen simply because we are able to partake and feast at the table one with another and to enjoy fellowship over such a great meal on that particular day. No, no, no. Thanksgiving for the child of God is a every day, 365 day a year affair. Because the child of God understands that their relationship with God uh, was because of the power of God, the hand of God, and the saving blood of Jesus Christ. And for the child of God, when they wake up, their day, every day, begins with then they sing a song to the Lord. You ought to know that for the child of God, those of you who are Christians, that because we have been going through this pandemic, or should I say since we have been going through this pandemic, it has raised awareness as to how grateful we ought to be and how thankful we should be in our hearts to the Lord. Every day that we get up, some of you have already battled COVID. Some of you have lost loved ones due to COVID. But yet, strangely enough, God has saw fit for you to still be here. And as a result of that, as a result of his graciousness, as a result of him breathing air into your nostrils, you ought to wake up with a then I'll sing a song to the Lord. <clears throat> what took place, my dear friends? What happened that would cause Israel to then sing a song to the Lord? Well, those of you who are Bible students, you know what, what has taken place. God has intervened into the lives of Moses and Israel and God has delivered Israel. 
Israel as he promised and on schedule from the hand of Pharaoh and his army. You recall that in chapter 14 that Moses uh, went down to Egypt to deliver Israel from Pharaoh and Pharaoh had a change of heart. God would rain plague after plague and he would give, bring turmoil and pain after pain upon Israel, uh, the uh, Egyptians and he would, he would often demonstrate how powerful he was over their idol gods and over the gods that they had uh, made up in their mind. And God, time and time again, would defeat the, uh, uh, the Egyptians' idol gods and would show that he was the one true God and that he was the sovereign God. And then on the last one, God struck their child, the firstborn of every family. And you know that God had told them that sprinkle the blood on the doorpost and uh, I will pass, the death angel will pass by. And God, after doing that, commanded Moses to lead Israel on their new journey into the land of Canaan that God had promised. But on the way, headed to the promised land, on their way, headed to victory and to their new destination, Pharaoh had a change of heart. And Pharaoh, the Bible says, chased behind uh, the, uh, the Israelites and he, he was coming up with all of his army, his chariots and horses, and they were in pursuit of God's people. And you remember the Bible says in chapter 14 that God's people happened to turn back and they beheld the Egyptians coming on their trail. And <clears throat> you, you remember the story that they looked, the Bible says they beheld them and they became frightened. They were disenchanted. Their hearts sunk because now the enemy that they thought they had forsaken or they had left it behind and the enemy that they thought they had gotten rid of, he has now raised up again to, to destroy them completely. But Moses says something to Israel and he gives them comfort and assurance when he says, listen, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Because these enemies, take a good look at them, because these enemies that you see today, you will no longer see ever again. And I want you to stand still. I want you to be patient. I want you to have courage because God is getting ready to do a mighty thing in your life. But then after God opens the Red Sea, Israel walks on dry land, God then tells Moses to stretch out his hand over the Red Sea and the waters cover up the Egyptians, Pharaoh and all of his army. And as they walk on dry land, right after deliverance, guess what Israel does? The Bible says, then they sang a song to the Lord. What am I suggesting to you, brothers and sisters? That when God saves us, when God does something great for us, when God is magnificent in our lives each and every day, I am suggesting to you that every day you wake up, you ought to wake up singing a song to the Lord. Isn't it wonderful and grand to know that God, because of his awesomeness, because of his greatness, because of his mighty deeds in our life, he puts a new song each and every day in our, uh, in our hearts and through our lips. I need to also suggest to you that you should not sing a song only when you wake up, but by God, even through the day, even when you're on your job, even when you're in your home, you ought to be singing the song to the Lord of the goodness of the Lord. When you lay down and go to bed at night, you ought to be singing a new song to the Lord of how worthy he is of your praise and your adoration, how great God has been in your life and how great God has been in your children's life. You ought to then sing a song to the Lord. Well, I want you to see why Israel sung of this magnificent song to the Lord. They sung this song to the Lord because of who God was. And they sung the song to the Lord because of what God did. And lastly, they sung this song to the Lord because of what God would do for them in the future. Let me just tell you, church, as we revisit that,
that event, you have reason to sing a song to the Lord because of who God is, because of what God does, and for what God will do. Praise is to its highest level when you understand those three components, when you understand who he is, when you understand what he did, and when you understand what he will do for you. You can't help but be thankful to God for being such an awesome and mighty God in your life. The text says, then Moses and all of Israel sang this song to the Lord. Now watch it. They sung this song to the Lord. The word Lord is used, church, 10 times in chapter 15, which expresses Yahweh, Jehovah, the self-existing one. It suggests that God is sufficient. God needs no one to sustain him. He needs nothing to exist. God exists all by himself. And because he is self-existing, whenever God needs to do something, whenever God needs to create something, he consults himself and he looks within himself to bring about the blessing he needs to do and the task that needs to be accomplished in our lives. God is self-sufficient. They sang a song to the Lord. They sang a song to the self-existing one. I need you to understand understand whenever Jehovah uh, whenever God is getting ready to do something great in our life he reveals himself through his name the name Jehovah the name Yahweh expresses the greatness of God the self-existence of God and God's self-revealing of himself it, 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 he, as a matter of fact he reveals who he is in the reality of our needs so whenever you need something, you, whenever you, you cry out to God, God reveals to us who he is right in the reality of what we need. Church, I don't know about you, but I need him to be Jehovah Shalom. He is my peace. I need him, church, to be Jehovah Jireh, for he will provide for me. I don't know where you are in your life, but I just believe that wherever you are, God will reveal who he is uh, by the greatest of your needs. John, uh, Moses and Israel sang a song to the Lord. He was self-existing. He was, he was mighty indeed. He, he, remember remember uh, when God told Moses to go and deliver Israel, Moses responded to God by saying, Now God help me, who is it? Uh, that I should tell sent me. And you remember God said I am that I am. In other words, I am God all by myself. And when you understand that it was God who delivered you, when it was God who kept you, when it was God who was protecting you, when it was God who was providing for you, you'll understand that in every aspect of our life, we have a then we sung a song to the Lord. Oh, church, listen, they understood who God is, which means, church, salvation demands a response from the recipients. See, whenever God saves us, whenever God delivers us, whenever he does something great for us and through us, it always will demand our response. We are the recipients of God's grace, of God's salvation. And so it is incumbent upon us to realize who he is uh, and then what he has done, which we'll get to in a minute, but it also it induces worship and praise, adoration, respect, and awe for God who has done such a mighty thing in our life. So salvation demands our response. Now, what it, what it, it also means, whenever God does something great, we ought to always give him glory. So whenever God is doing something, see the problem with us, it, oftentimes, is that God does something great for us, God does something mighty for us, he has delivered us, he has been so good to us, we forget God and we go on about our daily walk. But what God is saying to us, what Moses teaches us, is that when God does something great in our life, then the recipients ought to give God his greatness glory. I will sing. Notice what they do. They, they sing a song to the Lord which acknowledges who 
God is. He is Jehovah, right? Who he is, he is the God who must be ascribed power, victory, majesty, honor. He is a, he's a God that demands respect. But listen, can I tell you something? In Revelation chapter 15, John echoes the song of Moses when it came to the children of God having victory even in the, in, under the new covenant. Let's prove it. Look at Revelation chapter 15. In Revelation chapter 15, notice verse number one. The Bible says, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. Mm -hmm. I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name standing on the sea of the glass holding hearts of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the bond servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Watch, listen to the song. Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all the nations will come and worship before you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. What is he saying? Just as God revealed his righteous acts, his mighty hand in working deliverance for the people of Israel, he says, even under the new covenant, there will be victory over the Roman Empire, over the Roman Emperor, over persecution. He said, now that you have been saved by the blood of Christ, even under the new covenant, you have reason to sing a new song. <laughs> yeah, you got reason to sing. And watch, notice when the new song, well, notice when the song was sung. Come back to verse 50, chapter 15, verse 1. I saw a, uh, a verse 2, rather. And I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire. Those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name standing on the sea of glass holding the hearts uh, of God. In essence, he is, John is saying, just like Moses and all of Israel sang a song to God after victory, after deliverance, he says, now that you are a child of God, you should sing a song because you have victory in Jesus Christ. What am I saying to you, church? You have reason to be thankful. You have more than enough reasons to be thankful to God and to have praise on your lips. And it doesn't come simply because you have a turkey on your table. It doesn't come simply because you have turkey a dressing and yams and all the greens and all of the foods that come with Thanksgiving feasts and, and dinners. You are thankful to God for his deliverance and salvation. Thankful to God for his mighty hand in saving you even from yourself. Thankful to God that you are covered by the blood of almighty Christ. And thankful to God that you have a relationship, fellowship with the Father through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm thankful, church, not just for material things, but I'm thankful for God saving bread from bread. I'm thankful to God that I could have been in my grave, but thank be to God, he has made me alive in Jesus Christ, and there's always a song on my heart. They sang a new song, church. Yeah, they sang a new song. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and his riders. Now look at this. The horse and his rider has been hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. Now we move from who the Lord is to what the Lord has done. But now notice, he says, the Lord is my strength. Notice who he is. He says, the Lord is my strength, and he has become my salvation. In chapter 14, verses 30 and verse 30 
uh, verses 13 and verse 30, Moses says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. As a matter of fact, he says, and keep quiet. As you keep quiet, see the salvation of the Lord. Sometimes, church, God is just simply warning us to maintain composure, keep quiet, stop running our mouths all the time, complaining about nothing that you cannot or anything that you cannot change. He says, be quiet, watch silently, and notice how God moves. Now, he says, he, he is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. This, notice how personal Moses gets, all of Israel gets. They say, this is my God, <laughs> and I will praise him, my father's God, and I will extol him. Now watch verse 3. The Lord is a warrior. He's trying to explain to them in song who God is. Church, look at this. The Lord, they say, who, who is God to me? He's my strength and song. Who is God to me? He is my salvation. Who is God to me? He is my warrior. And his Lord is his name. Israel is saying, I'm singing this new song because of not only what God has done for us, they're singing, they're singing this song because they know emphatically who God is to them. I need to say that again. They are worshiping God, singing praise to God because they know without a shadow of a doubt who God is to them, which means in order to worship God properly, you must know God personally. In order to worship God properly, you have to know God personally. Yeah. In order to praise God like this, you've got to know Him. In order to give your everything into, uh, into your worship and your Him. And so they know Him personally, and they know Him, church, by experience. They saw God bring plague after plague against Israel, I mean up against the Egyptians. They saw how God worked in opening up the Red Sea. They experienced the power and goodness of God working in their life that they couldn't help but give him praise for. Oh, what has God done? They are praising him for what he has done. Now watch this. When they praise him for what he has done, they're going to they're going to praise him in a description of God's weaponry. In other words, the weapons God used to defeat their enemy. Notice now they're saying that God uses actual swords, and but what they're ascribing to him is his power. Now watch this. In verse five, it says. Uh, the deeps covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Uh, your right hand, O oh Lord, is majestic in power. Look at this, church. Uh, your right hand, O oh Lord, shatters the enemy. And in greatness of your excellence, you overthrow those who rise up against you. What are they praising God for? They are praising God for who he is, and they're praising God, they're thankful to God for what he has done. Church, you must never allow praise and thanksgiving to slip and evade your heart, because when you think about it each and every day, God has given us more reasons to understand what he has done for us that deserves our praise, it deserves our attention, it deserves our heart, it deserves our complete consecration because God is working every day of our life. I'm so thankful that God doesn't go to sleep on my problems. I'm thankful that God doesn't uh, show unconcern about my pain. I'm thankful that God is such a uh, concerning God uh, and an attentive God that God will make sure he is constantly paving the way for his child. You look and they said, 
God, your right hand is majestic in power. Your right hand shatters the enemies. Look at how that brings confidence to the child of God. He says, and in the greatness of your excellence, you overthrow those who rise up against you. You send forth your burning anger. It consumes them as chaff. As chaff and at the blast of your nostril, the waters were piled up. Now, I like what he said. He says, you send forth your burning anger and it consumes them. Another translation says, as stubble. You remember in chapter 5, verse 12, uh, 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 Exodus chapter 5, verse 12, uh, Pharaoh added uh, insult to injury by making them go get stubble and, uh, and to build and to, to use things that, they, that, was, that was almost impossible to use to build what he wanted built. But then God turns the tables and what Pharaoh used uh, as, as a as an instrument of uh, degradation and as an instrument of ridicule, God takes the stubble and he made Israel use and he turns them into stubble. <laughs> God has a way, dear friends, of putting thanksgiving in our heart when he shows us that the very thing that the enemy tried to use against you, he'll take that very thing and turn your enemy into it. Boy, I'm so glad we got an awesome God who protects us from the enemy. He keeps us, church. And even if the enemy does get at us, it's God's hand, God's power, God's wisdom and might that overturns the table. He, he says, uh, verse 9, the enemy said, I will pursue and I will overtake, I will divide the spoil by death. My desire shall be gratified against them, and I will draw out my sword, and my hand will destroy them. They, look, they're, they're in their song. They're, they're rehashing what, what Pharaoh was saying. This is what I'm going to do. I, I'm going to pursue them. I'm going to overtake them. Uh, I will divide them as spoil. He said, my gratitude is, is, will, 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 uh, it, it will destroy them. And he says, they, but then... You blew your wind. Verse 10. Look at this church. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you among the gods, O oh Lord? Look at, look at what Pharaoh is saying. Pharaoh says, look, I'm going to pursue them. I will overtake them. I will divide them as spoil. My desire will be gratified. He says, I'll draw out my sword. My hand will destroy them. But then Israel, in a call and response to the song, said, But you blew your wind, Lord. <laughs> oh, your enemy, church, you may, unbeknown to you, you may have some enemies over there plotting and scheming on your demise. They are plotting that you fall. They are plotting that everything you touch will fail. And then you have to have the song of Israel on your lips and heart by saying, God, then you blew your wind. God, you showed up right in the nick of time. God, you put an end to the plan of my enemies. Look at this. Look at what they say. They say, you blew your wind and the sea covered them. <laughs> they sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you among the gods, O oh Lord? Now, within this, they are praising God for what he has done. And they're praising God for the weapons that he used. And then they're praising God for the character he exhibits. They're praising his character. Look at verse 11 again. Who is like you among the gods, O oh Lord? Who is like you majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, and working wonders? Here's the thing. They are praising God for being their mighty warrior. Here, here it is. They are also praising God for wiping out their enemies. Notice something. They say, God, you are majestic in holiness, which means a holy God, an absolute holy God, cannot tolerate and allow sin to go unpunished. So what does God do? Because of his holiness, because of his character being holy, because he is absolutely holy, God in his holy acts destroys the sinner 
which would be, in this case, the Egyptians. He destroys them and keeps them from destroying, which means because of God's holiness, that would suggest that there is anything the enemy does or tries to do to me that they'll get away with. No, God's holiness will not allow him to, uh, to, to pass over sin and evil. Oh, the, uh, they say, uh, awesome in praises, working wonders, you stretch out your right hand and the earth swallowed them. In your loving kindness, you have led the people whom you redeemed. Now we've got something else. So they praise God for the weapons he uses. They praise God for his power. They praise God for his character. They praise God for his mercy. Notice, you stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. Now notice what they didn't say. Because remember, in Exodus 14, it was God who told Moses, stretch out your hand and your rod uh, over the sea. Notice in the psalm, they didn't say, Moses stretched out his right hand and the earth swallowed them. What they are saying is, they understood, we saw Moses, God's leader, stretch out his right hand over the sea. But in our song, we recognize it wasn't the hand of Moses per se. It was God's power working through Moses that split this Red Sea. They said, we saw in your right hand when you split the Red Sea and the earth swallowed them in your loving kindness, you have led the people whom you have redeemed. In your strength, you have guided them in your holy habitation. The people have heard and they tremble. Now they're praising God for his person because now when God reveals himself, all of the heathen nations will tremble. You remember in Joshua chapter 2 when God, when, when God through Moses, he sent, uh, they send the spies out, Joshua that is, send the spies out to spy out the land. And you remember uh, Rahab, what does Rahab say to them, Rahab the harlot? She, she acknowledges who they are and she says, we have heard what your God did to the Egyptians. Now they are expressing praise for his person. That just at the person of God, just at God revealing himself, however he so chooses, it causes the enemy to tremble. You want to know sometimes, church, why you get the flack you get, why people hate the way they hate, why people uh, attack you the way they attack you, because they want to keep you from being the recipient of something great God is doing in your life. If the enemy can keep you focused on negativity, on things that are not of God, then they can keep you from being great for God. The people's heard, they tremble, anguish, and has gripped the inhabitants of Philistia. Philistia, the chief of Edom, were dismayed. The leaders tremble and grips the, and, and it grips them. And so here's the thing, church. What God wants us to get is that true worship involves a true witness to who God is and what God does. True worship demands a true witness to who God is and what God does. So church, what God expects of us is to proclaim and to show forth in our lives just how great he has been to us. Listen, they realized that even their enemies, people who were not Israelites, recognized and honored how great their God was. I am so perplexed that there are people who are not necessarily Christians but believe in God. They have more faith in God than the people who have been saved by God. Third point, and we're moving on. What God will do. So they praise him for who he is. They give thanks to God for who he is. They give thanks to God for what he, um, for what he has done. And they are now giving thanks to God for what God will do. That means they are praising God for the promises 
he keeps. Look at this. Terror and dread fall upon them. By the greatness of your arm, they are motionless as, stone, as, as a stone. Until your people, watch it now, watch the promise. Until your people pass over, O oh Lord, until the people pass over whom you have purchased, you will bring them and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance. The place, O oh Lord, which you have made for your dwelling. The sanctuary, O oh Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. And just as long as God sits on his throne, just as long as God reigns upon his throne as sovereign king, as Jesus is our Lord, he wants us to know God will forever keep his promise. God will forever sit on the throne. God will forever keep covenant. God will forever reign. God will forever see to it that his people are blessed. And it is our job, our responsibility to make sure we give thanks to God for him keeping promise. Look at Psalms chapter 44. Look at Psalms chapter 44. Psalm chapter 44. Psalms chapter 44, the Bible says, look at verse 1, O God, we have heard with our ears, our fathers have told us the work that you did in their days, in the days of old, with your own hand, you drove out the nation, then you planted them, you afflicted the peoples, then you spread them abroad. For by their own sword they did not possess the land, and their own arm did not save them, but your right hand and your arm and the light of your presence, for you favored them. It was God who brought all of this about. Now this generation, they are praising God here in the psalm. They're acknowledging what God did for their forefathers. They are acknowledging the promise, covenant-keeping God and how he maintained that relationship and that covenant with them based on God's faithfulness and not Israel's. Notice, look at Psalm chapter 80. Psalm chapter 80. Look at Psalm chapter 80 verse, uh, Psalm chapter 80. Look at verse 4. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with the prayer of your people? You have fled from them with the bread of tears, and you have made them to drink tears in large measure. You make us an object of contention to our neighbors, and our enemies laugh among themselves. O oh God of hosts, restore us, and cause your face to shine upon us, and we will be saved. You removed a vine from Egypt, and you drove out the nations, and planted it. You cleared the ground before it, and took it, and it took deep root, and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shadow and the cedars of God with this bowl. Now look at it. It says you removed the vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground before it. They are acknowledging what God did and how God kept covenant for them, for his people. Church, we must understand that thanksgiving, true thanksgiving, is expressed when we recognize who God is, when we recognize what God did and or does, and when we recognize what God will continue to do for us in the future. It is my prayer that you have been blessed by this lesson. It is my prayer that you have been reminded that your thanksgiving isn't necessarily what you eat. Because you can, you can have food on the table and not have an appetite to eat it. Our thanksgiving is because of who he is, what he did and does, and what he will continue to do for us in the future. He is a covenant-keeping God. I pray that someone, under the sound of my voice, will want to give their life to a Lord who is covenant-keeping, a Lord who is willing to save them, a Lord who is willing to, to protect them and keep them covered under the blood of Jesus Christ. 
I pray that you give your life to the Lord. Put faith in the Lord Jesus. Repent, turn from this world, and give your life to him in the watery grave of baptism. And let God be your God. Let God be your redeemer, your warrior, your strength. And may he put a new song in your heart. God bless you. Cling, cling to the 
Now we come to the portion of our worship service, which is our communion, time of remembrance, taking our minds back to the cross to remember the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior. In the book of Acts, chapter 20, beginning in verse number 7, we are commanded to partake of the Lord's Supper on the first day of every week. In 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, began 23rd verse, the Bible says, For I have received of the Lord, that which also delivered unto you. The Lord Jesus, the same that was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do, remember of me. After the same master of the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as often as ye drink it, remember of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, he proclaimed the Lord's death till he comes. At this time, let's go to Heavenly Father in prayer on behalf of the bread. I do kind, merciful Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we come before you at this time, Lord, as you bless us, Lord, take part of this bread. Ever since the Son's broken body, hope, Lord, we take it in a manner that's pleasing and acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' precious name we do pray. Amen. Now let's pray for the cup. I do kind, merciful Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless us, Lord, take part of this fruit of the vine. Ever since the sun shed its blood. Oh Lord, we take it with clean hands and pure heart. In Jesus' precious name we do pray. Amen. That now concludes the Lord's Supper. We now come to the portion of our worship service, which is the collecting of contributions. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter, began in the first verse, Now concerning collection for the saints, is that I have given order to the church of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store. As God has prospered you, that there be no gatherings when I come. You have multiple opportunities to give at this time. We have our text to give. We have our secure lockbox located on the outside of the church building where you can actually come and drop your collection off. And if you want to, you can actually mail your contribution in. Our address, 1709 Staley Avenue, Savannah, Georgia, 31404, 31405. So, as you see, you have multiple opportunities to give. So at this time, let us go to Heavenly Father in prayer on behalf of all those who have given. Our dear kind, merciful Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we come before you at this time, Lord, as you continue to bless all those who gave. Heavenly Father, we ask you to continue to bless all those, Lord, who desire to give, Lord, but unfortunately weren't able to at this particular time. We hope we continue to use your, this money, Heavenly Father, for the up and your kingdom here on earth. In our Jesus' precious name we do pray. Amen. Well, saints, that brings us to a close. I pray that you will have thanksgiving, the power of thanksgiving. It will always keep your mind on God and his mighty hand. Pray that you will understand who God is, what God did, and what God is doing in your life, and what God will continue to do. He is a covenant-keeping God. I want you to join me in prayer for all those who are on our prayer list. Father God, we thank you for being a covenant God. We thank you, Father, for being Jehovah God, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shalom. We thank you, Father, for being all that we need and all that we desire. Father, you satisfy us. You keep us, Father. You grant us the things that we, uh, we ask. And many times, Father, you grant us blessings that we didn't ask for. Father, you are such an awesome God. And we pray that you will hear our prayers on behalf of all of those on our sick list. Father, that you heal them. We're praying by faith, Father, knowing that if it's your will, you will, you will, you will bless them. Father, we pray that as we go through the holidays that we are never uh, uh, absent from the reality that every day is a day of thanksgiving. We thank you, dear God, for being awesome. We thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for us. Father, we have more reasons to be thankful and grateful than we do to doubt and to complain. Father, we would be ever careful to give you all the praise, glory, and honor. It's in his name we pray. Amen. I want to be to to my feet. I want to be to win. To fly away. I know the world came to me. I want to win. I want to be to win. To my face. I want to be to win. To bear my feet. I want to be to win.
Yeah. 